<laughs> anyway, uh, I highly recommend that you go to um, Clifton Harrison and on his YouTube channel and subscribe because that's how um, we support each other these days. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's see. So we had a conversation, Daria and Katie and I, because it's of course the middle of the night right now in in London. Um, we had a, a we recorded a conversation with the three of us in Clifton, and it just went in a lot of different directions. He's such an interesting young man, and um, we hope you really enjoy it. It's about a sixty minute uh, video, and assuming that in fact we don't, we probably don't need to start with this particular video if it's not going to. Oh, you've got it. So yeah. here's Clifton Harrison. Just beautiful, 
just so beautiful. And, and I don't know about you, but my heart is uh, very much in need of that kind of um, reassurance this week. So um, I, I actually, I bought the, that version of the four viola, four viola arrangement of that piece. And the next time we get together, guys, the next time we have a, um, you know, a viola mania or whatever, we can, we can put that together. Uh, there's also a link in the um, information about this uh, session, the NCVS Panda session that Daria put up in the comments. There's a link to where you can buy that music. So I think uh, we should all, take that on as our new anthem. I love that. Um, so I, go ahead and download the, uh, those two documents if, if you want to have that information. Oh, it's gorgeous. Um, and so creative to think of doing that and, um, and pulling it off as well so beautifully. So I'm going to try and um, share this video. And I think without further ado, and just let me know right away if you can't hear it. Um, I'm going to just say one real quick thing, which is that um, we'll, like I said, this is about an hour long and uh, Clifton, of course, can't be with us right now because he's sleeping. But um, if you want to, if you have questions that you want us to address, um, type them into the chat and we can stick around after this is over and talk amongst ourselves if you'd like. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, one of the things I was wondering is, I wonder if you would like to tell us how is it that you ended up in London after um, obviously you're an American man. So, hi everybody. Uh, again, Clifton. Uh, yeah, I ended up in London in a kind of roundabout way. Really, um, I landed here in 2010. Uh, a couple of years, a few years before that, I decided that I wanted to travel a bit with my job. So um, I left my comfortable, you know, time in the Midwest and decided to move uh, to Mexico, where I was in uh, two orchestras there for a few years, just to get my feet wet and have what, what it felt like to be to be in a different country. And I got the bug. So whilst there, um, one of the last conductors I was working with, uh, he was a, a music director in Portugal. And then he needed a guest. He says, would you like to, would you like to come to Portugal? I said, well, yes, I would. <laughs> I'd love to do that. So um, he had me play so the panel could hear me. He already knew because he was there for two weeks, whatever. So then um, I knew that was going to happen. And, and I decided that I wanted to actually change focus and not only be an orchestral player, which is what I'd done since I was about 19 years old professionally, was playing just in orchestras and opera orchestras. And I loved it, but I just I wanted to see what else was going on before I felt like I needed to, you know, keep, have my roots somewhere firmly planted. So um, I decided to uproot myself and putting Portugal aside for a second, I decided to apply to the Royal Academy of Music uh, to do a, a double in Baroque viola and modern viola which was new to me, really. Um, I played a bit, but I really was interested in to see what I could learn from that. And also it would be chamber music and these things that, you know how as professionals and, and as people that are too busy to do other things, you don't always get to play the works that you really want to, 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 to get, you know, sink your teeth into. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to do that. So that means I had, I had the Royal Academy in my back pocket, as well as this, this temporary job, which was great because it was very confined, like six months, it was like a seven and a half month contract, something like that. I knew it was going to end, and, I, and then I knew what I was going to do next. So I said, right, I'm going to do all of this. So I left, I, I left Mexico, went to Portugal, came back to the U.S. for just a bit, you know, visa issue, then moved to London. And um, then from London, I, I, everything kind of fell into place, which is great. Um, it's a great city if, if, you, if you know how to work it, which is pretty much, you can know that about anywhere really. It, it takes a bit of, of, of drive to get things going, but if you have the energy, you pretty much can, you can, you can get something done. So I just I persevered and um, lots of opportunities came my way and I took, I took advantage of them, which is what I learned to do as an adult, as opposed to being much younger and trying to do this. Um, so yeah, it, it just, it progressed there. And funny enough, um, when I was looking for something like chain music that was permanent, um, my advisors, by chance, that were at the Royal Academy of Music, they needed a new viola player in their quartet, which has been around since 1988. And the last viola player was from 1998 to 2000 and 
15 is when I joined. Um, they, they were looking all over the place and they had said, well, why don't you come in? We like how you, you know, you, you play lots of different styles and everything. So let's have you come in. And I, I won the job. So that was very good. And then sessions started happening. Happening. It's different in the UK with recording sessions. It's a very, it's actually, I don't even know because I never got into the recording session uh, field in, 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 I was, I was living in New York and in Chicago and, and Milwaukee. And I know it's, it was very, it was a niche group of people that could do these things. And London is, is, is exactly who you know to get in because all of the main, the concert masters and the principals and the everyone of all everything are in this, are in these orchestras and everyone you sit anywhere you like and you know, and it, but people have been in it for 20, 25 years, 30 years. And so I was very privileged to get in to that, to doing that, which was great. So that added to my career, which kept me looking at different genres because the films and video games and things, it's all different types of music, you know, you, you, and it's thrown at you. Uh, I learned in the UK that the number one talent you must have is the ability to sight read because nothing is rehearsed. And as an American, I remember when I first went to the Academy, Royal Academy of Music, um, I had the little orchestral audition. I thought, this is silly. I've been doing this for years. Why do I, why do I care about, you know, I should be fine doing this. And the, the head of the string department says, yeah, it was great, apart from you need to sight read better. <laughs> and I told her without without question, I said, well, at my job in America, I, I would come prepared. I really <laughs> you didn't have to sight read a Bookner symphony. You knew it was coming, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but I found out quickly in the UK, that's really important because like today again i just came back from recording um it's for it's a thing which we can't ever say what it is until it happens but the, you never get the music beforehand you just show up on the thing and you play it and i had two solos didn't know they were even there you know and have to just do it light on do it and i learned that slowly through the royal academy of music um that's funny it's the biggest talent that that the brit the brits have on the on americans <laughs> is the ability i mean it's funny if you go to london symphony it sounds like the concert is going to happen and it, it's the first reading of a thing they didn't know was happening. Cause you only have the quick, yeah, it's a quick, quick turnaround for everything here. I remember my job in the US, it was it was like two, Tuesday morning, then Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon rehearsal. And then Wednesday afternoon had the soloist if there was one. And then Thursday, you have three concerts, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, same program. Right. <laughs> no. right. Yeah, it would be every day there's something, it's usually 2.30 to 5.30 PM rehearsal and then the concert that night. <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes it's two days because it, the Mahler Symphony number, whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. So everything is very, very fast here. I imagine, what, I imagine that's kind of like what it would have been like in Beethoven's time, you know, when they just scribble it off and here, go play it. Okay. Now we've got exactly. the next one. So yeah, that's I think that's how they, yeah. I think that's how they even look, they look at it. That is also meant to be polished on the spot, meaning it needs to find itself in the performance and in the, in the, in the, its own way. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was taught a very different way of, of preparing for, for ensemble playing. So that it was just, it's wonderful. Now I'm, I'm well, I'm into it now. So I get it. But I think if, if, if someone, if, if I were to be thrown into it again, I would hope to have better skills <laughs> of sight reading because it's actually well, quite I tough. Well, you are you are blazing the trail for us, and and uh, it, it seems like you're going from. In my observation of it, it seems like you're going from success to success. So, oh, hurrah! You. Thank you again so much thank for you. joining us today. It's really um, great for us to be able to hear um, your point of view. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it must be said too that it's it's, it's interesting. In I think singularly here in London, um, to, the. the I play lots of different genres because it's, it's easy to do so here. Because unlike the well, the U.S. there's New York, there's L.A., there's San Francisco, there's there's the there's the South, there's the middle, and everything, and there's different sounds and everything. All of those big cities are one in London. Of course, there's Manchester, there's Edinburgh, and there's there's Birmingham, all these things. But in London, you have the pop world. The so you have the you have Hollywood. We do lots of lots of um, almost all the films I do are are American films. Sorry, because <laughs> we've taken all the <laughs> film work. Yeah, um, yeah, we know. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's getting done. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah. But um, yeah. It, so in the same week, I can do, I can, I can, I can do the Boulez Festival and then a Bach, you know, with Baroque Ensemble and also a, mar mar a marble film and a string quartet, avant-garde quartet, where we're, you know, like squeaking away doing fun, you know, fun and interesting things with a dancer. So that, that it, it's very singular to have that here. Because I know in Berlin and in Vienna and all over Europe, it's not the same. It, it, it's just, it's just because it's so condensed with everything being in the same place here that if you, you, depending on what you want to do, you can find a way to do it. 
And if there were, if there is, I mean, apart from these COVID times and the pandemic, um, if there wasn't a concert, you can make one happen, meaning live. It's you just have to go and make it happen. Find somebody to support it. The government supports it. You just do a thing and you make it happen. So yeah, um, it's one of those things where it, the sky's the limit as long as you're willing to work for it. So that's that's something to think about. That's definitely something you think about, and it it also seems like um, this this uh, sort of blossoming has also continued during this time of pandemic when at least from my perspective everything has really ground to a halt absolute complete halt yeah. um and it seems like the your experience in london has been um much more um entrepreneurial and much more uh productive than what i've seen going on there are some places in the united states that are uh, that are you know eking out performances and and being um creative with ways to get music in front of um audiences yeah. But it sounds like it's almost like uh, it, it, it feels almost like business as usual in London. And I, I think that's a lot to do with spirit of people like you. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The spirit is there. It's just we, we, we've had pop, there's no there are no live. Perform well, there are some in, until possibly today <laughs> live performance uh, with with audience, which it would be very, very uh, socially distanced and all these things. So nothing was viable to to do. So the whole West End, which is Broadway in here, what, it, it shut down and uh, those were the jobs that were very very stable so it was a shock to the system for most people and a few colleagues like I, I, i've had some sessions that, that come those are the ones that have been working because um again it's like anything that you can go to the office for you can go into recording the studio for but we can't perform so i could do this you know thing today but i you could never have an audience so um we all thought come together and make our own thing which i did i mean i was just not bored i was just not depressed either i was just needing to do something when the pandemic began well, well when the lockdown began first in march so um you know on a whim uh, i said i'm just gonna start recording myself and also wait i don't want this to be a thing where i'm making these polished video you know you know and mastered video which i can do but that's not that was entirely not the point the point was to feel like i was playing something for someone and including myself but and others just putting it out there and letting it be as it is as if a concert were, were happening and i chose some works that i just felt like playing that sometimes had nothing to do with anything <laughs> which is that that's so great we could just go i'll play that one you know and um uh, i found some some friends to join me sometimes and and other times just played on my own and other times i bought like the the piano accompaniment to things and i tweaked the piano accompaniment to match what i wanted to do and then that that bit i did do to make it so it was slow down when i wanted it to all these things and some i didn't i just played i got a few that you're, you're you know make sure that it had the copyright for it and it just played played it as is and tried to work out how long the pause was <laughs> right, right. you know it just right. just for fun and then and then I do it a few times as practice and then right I'm going to film it and I did it yeah. and then whatever comes out comes out and that actually felt good and that turned into um people saying I have my equipment here which I, I have slowly over the over the years have acquired more so during pandemic time um knowing to get a better mic like my, my whole um ideology for this is that you should get the best equipment where you can afford. It's really important to do that at the time and don't overspend none of that. Just when you, if you have a bit of extra this or you think you need this, look for, look, set a budget and then see what you can afford. And often you can find something really nice and nothing goes to waste. So my very first mic, which is sitting way over there, I use it as an ambient mic now, which is around the way when I'm recording. And I use a better mic right here. And I have the, I have, I have the sister to this as well that makes the stereo. Then I have some other ones, all these ones that I, I over the time added to my my collection and it was not a one-time thing it was just over time and got some better headphones and asked people I said which how do you know which which studio headphones to get oh they're, they're 80 80 pounds which is about like a hundred dollars I thought they'd be like thousand or something for the studio they're not and it's just the normal ones that everyone uses you know for this type of thing and I just slowly built this equipment so having this equipment really has helped because people have seen which was not even my intent at first, but people have seen that I have equipment. So they say, can you self-record for projects? And they're like, oh yeah, I can. Okay, what do you have? You send the list. Then all of a sudden you get this other work to self-record. I did a Netflix film in my in this room here. <laughs> it was a for string quintet. So I played both viola parts. Yeah. They didn't want they wanted to, they wanted, they, they, they wanted to control the room. And it's better for me to play both parts if they're going to have two violas. And they had to use it. I use my Chinese little little other viola <laughs> as a second viola because they wanted them to sound different, you know, differently. 
So it was great. And that was another experience I'd never done before. I certainly never played my my cheap 300 pound, so uh, $400 Chinese instrument on professional recording, <laughs> you know, but there well, you so go. You kind of hit the pandemic running because you were all, you were ready. And so when it was, or you had your equipment being uh, already coming. So yeah. when people said, oh my God, and the rest of us sort of fell on the floor and said, yes. where's my cassette deck? Yeah, um, true. You already yeah. had uh, the the um, you had the for the foresight to to be prepared to to be in your own space. Yeah, it's way cool. That's well, way funny. Cool. Funny enough, you brought up before. Uh, well, before I think before we started chatting, um, I did I, I produced a series called um, uh, Five British Caribbean Women Identity and yes. Aesthetic. Um, yes. It's a documentary series of thirty minute um, videos of five Black British Caribbean women who are composers. And when I did that, they, this is a few years ago now, like three, two years ago, three years ago. I can't remember what years are anymore because of <laughs> 2020 didn't happen. Right. Um, but when when I did that, the equipment I didn't have, I collected. Instead of hiring something or renting something, I used part of my fee to buy that and buy this bit and buy that bit. So a bunch of the bits like I already had, like the lights I have on right now were from that. Uh, that first mic that I showed you, I, it was from that. And my little, I have a little, um, well, it's a DPA mic that you use, the little tiny mics that go in a viola when you're when right. you're playing live concerts. I use that as a as a as a what is it, lavalier, whatever it's called, lavalier, the, yeah. lavalier mic. Yeah. You just you, you use what you have, and so yeah, so that's why I had this little kit, and I just made it better as as time as time went on. Yeah, so was, and also I'm keen, I'm I'm interested in in this type of thing anyway. So I, got, I had the my MacBook, so I had GarageBand at first, and I upgraded to. Uh, 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 what's it called logic pro and also then i tried just trial and error i was using final cut pro which is the video software i that doing that that um that documentary series i was just hitting buttons trying to figure out how things worked and watching youtube videos that's how i got to do it and i learned how to do all the graphics and yeah, the transitions and the effects and and the sound and everything from youtube videos so when I didn't know, and also I asked people, so on, on the internet, I go, how do you do this? Well, I'm stuck doing this. And, you know, so I learned all these things th just through trial and error as, as I went along. So Wait, luckily it helped. You seem uniquely positioned to um, sort of guide the way for us in this um, new and this brave new world, which doesn't have to be as horrid as, as some of it. So, yeah. So I know Dari wanted to talk to you a little bit about your instruments. There was, we talked about um, the fact that you play, via, played, via, you're a professional violist, um, and then that you branched out into um, uh, uh, period instruments, I guess. Um, I'm not yeah. a period instrument player, so I'll let Daria take that, those questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so um, Clifton, this has been riveting so far, but um, we do want to get to the Damore and uh, yeah. to have you sort of introduce the instrument. If you want to tell how you came to to playing the Damore, that would that would be good. But I guess we can do that a little later and just let you demo the instrument, and so we can okay. hear it and talk about it. Yeah. Okay. I'll just first. I'll just give a little little intro to this instrument. This is my viola Damore. If you can see. Um, they come in either six or seven stringed instruments and actually you double that because there are sympathetic strings underneath the bridge that you don't actually play. They ring and they, they, they as you're playing the, the main, the playing strings. Um, I opted for a convertible seven and seven, which means um, I can make it a six string or a seven string just by moving one of the, one of this big, the lowest string over onto the side. I don't know if you can see, let me see. It, it, it's stuck on the end. Mm -hmm. I see that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so I don't, that, that one isn't played. It's just on the side. So um, music written, uh, earlier music for the Jamari, which is at late 16th century, late 17th century uh, and through the 18th century, um, was mostly with six strings. But uh, later music, including some classical stuff, is all with seven. And Bach, no one knows because he 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 used the Damari for the sound quality as opposed to for the chordal quality of it. So most people you really really um, made use of the, the the chords. So it's tuned depending on what you're playing, the piece you're playing, uh, in in a chord. So this is tuned. I have no idea what it's tuned to now because it, it's it's winter and they're gut strings. <laughs> so I'll try and give a little. It should be D major, and this is D major at A equals four fifteen, which is which is is called the Baroque pitch, which is nearly a semitone 
lower than modern pitch, which is A equals 440. Um, this is a compromise, as, as Daria could tell you later, <laughs> that uh, it, all different pitches were used at all different times. I mean, from 460 going down to 392, which is almost a G where the A would be. Um, so anyways, 415 is what, what is used a lot as a, as a go-to for Baroque uh, players. And so the, what I'm playing now, it doesn't sound like a D major. It sounds like a D flat major. So um, when Vivaldi, who used the De Maury a lot, which is great, he wrote a few concertos with it and it, it, wonderful. Telemann also wrote some trio sonatas. Um, Bach used it in 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 uh, his Saint John's Passion, Saint Saint John's Passion, and uh, he used two of them actually in it, and some Bach and some cantatas. Uh, my favorite composer of the De Maury, he's called uh, Christoph Graupner. He's the subject of lots of my research. A German composer it, um, who's a contemporary of, of uh, Bach and Telemann. Uh, he, he wrote so many concertos and double concertos for viola de Mora and, and viola. Also viola de Mora and oboe de Mora and doubles. It's just amazing. But go back to Vivaldi. Uh, he made use of the chordal instrument. So the beginning of Vivaldi's, uh, what is three and two concertos, it starts like this. <laughs> And you can tell it's in the tessitura of the violin, isn't it? It's quite high. Um, the top D string here is one tone lower than the violin E string, but the bottom is lower than, a, it's, it, you can hear the viola. <laughs> so it's a wonderful, and you hear it ringing as well. That ringing is the sympathetic or the sympathetic strings. It sounds like a like a cathedral kind of. Even though, funny enough, they're out of tune right now because I can't keep them in tune because it's winter. <laughs> I mean, even when I this should be the same pitches as the top strings, but they won't be. <laughs> yeah, it takes a bit. It takes a good while to tune it. And normally I would have tuned it again, but I got home straight away before this. Uh, but you see, it doesn't matter. Christoph Graupner used the instrument as a, a tonal instrument in the alto clef. So he's worth noting, most of his music you can play using a viola because it's written in alto clef and it's not written in scordatura. I don't know if you know what that means, uh, everyone listening, but I know what these guys do, but uh, scordatura is when uh, you, you you write in a in a way where you, you place your fingers where the notes say on the, on the page, but that's not what is sounding. So, um, I can't show you one here, but um, Vivaldi, you just play where your fingers go. The top four strings are if, as if they're on the violin. And so you play exactly what you see playing the violin. The bottom, the next four, depending on the composer, they, they, they choose their own system. Sometimes you read it in alto clef as if it's on the viola, and other times you read it in treble clef, but skipping the top string. So these, these four, the next four are now the new four, or the bottom four, you see it. So, but that's the different composers. Grapner wrote it always. We tuned it all in fourths, all the strings instead of in fifths like the viola, but you go all the way down to B flat and you tune it in fourths and you you never read squadratura, you just read the notes that you see. And he always, everything was very melodic and it wasn't using this type thing. And so it, he used the sound of the, the sinewy, wonderful, celestial viola sound. It also must be noted too that the viola de more, um, no one knows what type of strings really this should be played on. That's why when I had my instrument, who's made by um, Jonathan Hill, he's a wonderful luthier here in, in the UK, um, we, he, we went along with my research to work out what to do. So it's convertible to six string to seven string, also convertible from Baroque to modern, and also convertible from, from wire strings, meaning not like modern wire strings, but actual like plain wire on the top. Because people think uh, Helene Plouffe, Helene Plouffe, you know, she's, she's based in Canada. She's a violinist, unfortunately. <laughs> but a wonderful, wonderful viola de Moore player. Um, she plays on wire playing strings and it's a completely different sound. So it's worth listening to see her. She's an expert in Telemann. The trio sonatas by Telemann are enchanting. They're, they're some of the most wonderful, written, wonderfully written music, you know, so far. And a lot, it's usually with flute and uh, uh, viola de Moore and, and continuo. There's another one with violin, but um, Graupner wrote countless ones as well. So it's worth Christoph Graupner. You should look him up. Um, do, you, do you have some of his music? Yeah, I can't. The problem is I can't play his music when I'm tuned in D major. 
Do you see what oh. I mean? There's a big problem. Yeah, you have with Yosemite. You have to have like three or four instruments when you do a concert. That's something to be said. When you do a concert, you can't just bring one instrument if you're playing different repertoire because you have different tuning systems. Good example: Bach, um, John's Passion. It's tuned in C minor. So I can't play anything in D major on that concert with this with the same with the same instrument. So we always borrow each other's instruments when we do concerts. So you have like two or three. Yeah, it's a shame. Is it kind of like, uh, so you end up do, doing the brain um, work that horn players always do. Exactly. Trying to decide what am I looking at, what do I want it to sound like, and what do I want my fingers to do. But you're always jumping, uh, like, it, like as you say, every composer has a different um, setup. So what an incredible um, brain work you're doing. Yeah. It, well, it, yeah, it's one of those things, it's, it, it's really lots of the, the homework you do first is so important. Um, I learned it from a colleague too, um, in, my, in the Chorus Quartet, he's called Peter Shepard Scarbed. He's the first violinist. Um, he puts me to shame. He will do a concert with like 10 different violins. Um, one, he has a, he's used a three, three string Stradivari violin, a piccolo violin, also a Baroque violin. He plays viola as well. And then sometimes, you know, how, if you've seen the score tour where the strings cross each other, like the G yeah. is, is on the other side. Yeah, like in, in Bieber and all these things. He'll play right. all of these pieces on one concert. And my mouth is just dropped the entire time. <laughs> so I try not to complain about when I have to do things like that. <laughs> I mean, it, it, <laughs> that's the Demore. And in my bow, um, interestingly enough, there is no bow that's made for the viola Demore which when I first was, was looking, I thought, okay, I need to get a bow. This is actually a tenor viol bow, which um, I could use a viola, a viola bow. Oops, I hit the mic. This is my Baroque viola bow. I could use this as well. I just like this tenor viol bow, which um, is, is played by a wonderful viola da gamba player who's now passed away, which is something, it doesn't matter. At the time, violinists would mostly play the Demar and some violas would play, viola players would play it as well. And you just use whatever kit you have. Um, I have my short bow. You see the difference. It's really, really, really short bow. For but it's really you can't see it in that thing. It's it's about half yeah, the length. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. yeah. We can tell. Could you could you do like one or two bars using each bow? Yeah, of course, can. Play the same thing. Yeah, let me play the bit of the slow movement. Give me a second. <laughs> Okay. Here's my normal the, the bow I use for Demore. Okay, that's one. My normal bro. Well, I have so many out right now, it's hilarious. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, it's got more less air in it, I think. Yes. And it, it, for me, for me, that one doesn't let it breathe as much than the, the strings. Here's my short bow, which is meant to be playing. Short bow stuff is um is usually fast and early. Let's see, just play this. around a bow, don't I? <laughs> so yeah, so you have to decide ornaments, especially, that's what this is great. This bow, the short bow was made for when you didn't slur ornaments. I'm not, I won't do it on here, but uh, there's, lo there's lots of repertoire where you... I'm not very good at it, but that, that, that's, all, all the different ornaments you do would always be separate. And, and later on, you would slur things and, and this would not be the best bow for that. But it's really good for fast up. See, it's quick. It's wonderful for that. Yeah. Is is your short bow uh, screwing or or? Yeah, the, yeah. It's it's. <laughs> you ready? It's 
It's a fake clip-in. It's it's a oh, hybrid, which I love. So um, I got, it made it for me. It's meant. It's a it's a 19th century, well, 21st century copy of a 19th century copy of a of a bow that was made uh, as a as an amalgamation between two things. So it looks like it should be a clip-in, and yeah, everyone always thinks it is until I twist. Yeah. <laughs> and just it's more stable. Yeah, it's really quite funny because my clip-in is here. Is here. But this yeah. was a consort bow, which was usually really early music. Um, you, this I'm one doesn't. Sorry, Christian, can you demonstrate that for us? Because uh, those of us who don't uh, know the ins and outs of these bows, I don't know what you mean by a clip in. All right, clip in. I can't undo it. Let me just put this down. So the clip in. Um, the bow doesn't move. Like it, this little piece of leather is the only thing keeping the tension. So it's clipped in here. I'm not going to pull it out, but it, it's clipped in where all you do is put it to tighten, to do the tension. And this is it. There's no check choosing which way you want to do it. Um, this one comes out, but it's really finicky at the moment. I don't want to pull it out because it's, it's goes, the hair goes all the way down and it's, you get stuck. But yeah, when I pull this out, it's just loose. And on, do you leave it? Uh, uh, you leave it like this. Yeah. No, you leave it like this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's made, it's made to stay this way. Oh Joyce, God. yeah, I don't uh, because this one isn't that high of tension. Do you see? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the other clip in, especially later ones, you want to undo because it just stretches the hair and it, and it works. Right. Yeah. Mine's very like a very sturdy stick. Yours look, looks yeah. more elegant. Uh, yeah. This one's made for really, really early. It's actually, I hate to say it, it's essentially useless for anything that I do. <laughs> I've never been able to use it. You know, <laughs> for yeah, any... it's cool to have. <laughs> I know, it's but it's cool fun to have. have. You get yeah. It. Yeah. 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 And then same time, lastly, I have, she just happens to be sitting here, a classical bow. Many people don't know that there is a difference in a classical bow. This is a late classical bow. It's actually a Dodd frog that um, lost its stick. So I had a stick made for it. And um, I used this just recently. We just, we did a Beethoven 9 um, on period instruments. But all separate. It was really weird to play. But anyway, it's all separate. But yeah, uh, it's a wonderful bow, and it's good on on the demore when you're playing classical, because this is what someone would have just picked up. Or it sounds completely different. Yeah, right. Oh, sorry. It's almost like a normal class. It's normal bow. Yeah, but this right. bow is great. You can play Schumann with Schubert with it. Excuse me. Um, I've done a Pagione Sonata and things with this, but it's gorgeous because what it does is you don't have to think of articulation. It does it for you. As Daria can probably tell you too, the best bow you have is the one that informs you with the style that you're working in. You know, you also have to, you have to, you have to put in your own stamp to it, but the, there's certain things that the bow allows you to do that are natural, which is why the bow was good for that at that time. And it moved on in history because it, it was no longer good for the new music that was being created. So something had to change and that's, but if you think about it, each of those time shots, those snapshots in time are perfect. So yeah, that's, this yeah. is my wonderful, wonderful classical bow. Uh, the same maker made three of the bows you've just seen. There's two more in the, but yeah, he's great. <laughs> so, uh, so can, yeah. you, can you talk a little bit about your posture when you're playing? Yeah. Um, your left hand looks familiar, mm -hmm. um, but, but the way the instrument is coming up to you and and the way you're using your head yeah can you can you talk a little bit about sure. that yeah well uh like most period instruments uh it was it's like it's customary to not use any type of shoulder rest i have this here which is a little those sticky pads that stick on your instrument it's just for friction because i wear you know as a man i wear sticky uh shirts that you know you can't you can't always you don't know what shirt you're wearing and usually with lots of women it's nice because you have your skin that you can put things on i never have that so that's that but viola de Mora is quite thicker than a than the viola and a violin. I mean, it's actually considerably thicker. And there's no lip. There's no, I forget there's a technical term for it. Um, but when it, when it stops the back, it just stops. There's no overhang. So um, when, you, when it comes to you, it's got to sit where it's comfortable. And for me, I have a slightly odd stance, how I play when I'm sitting and standing. But the viola is a bit more down than, than most people. But mm -hmm. I prefer it that way. And I've learned with my technique to, to work around that. But I mean, when I was a student, every time up and did it, you know, which actually I teach when I do the same thing. But for me, um, because of just how I'm shaped and everything, I have a short arm and I have a short pinky that I lose a lot of my track if I have the viola higher up. I'm really stuck in this like 
small little area that I can use. So that's why I've chosen, which I, I'm a big proponent in working out what works for you. Mind you, listening to whoever, whoever is, is helping <laughs> you, know, you, but also deciding that like each body, each physiology is different than, than another. So you have to figure out what works best for you. I was told by Russian teachers for years and years that my, my fourth finger playing high, it's, it, it's, it's, it's um, straight. It has to be, mine has to be because it's so short. I can't reach without changing positions. If not, so I learned over time to work out what was what worked for me. And that's one of the little idiosyncrasies that, that, that worked for me. Other things I learned that I was doing, like, you know, not having a straight boat, all these things you have to work out. But uh, certain little, 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 little tweaks are very, very common. Um, it's really important to know your body, you know, and sitting and standing because it's completely different, as we all know. I mean, it's incredibly different. I'm, I'm disabled because I had a, had a, I was in an accident a number of years ago. So it's difficult for me to stand for long periods of time. So I sit lots of the time. And when I do stand, it's completely a, uh, alien to me now. So now I have to practice trying to figure out where things are standing again. But also I use my legs differently and my weight differently because I can't, I can't, I'm not equal on my left and my right. It's about two thirds, one third actually. You know, and it's, it's actually quite, it's not comfortable. It's not 50, 50. And, um, but I've learned to deal with that as well. And I think we all can relate to any of the injuries or, or just, you know, shapes and sizes of whatever has come your way. But yeah. I've, I, I definitely, I think about what I'm doing. I think we all have to. Oh, um, do you have, um, do you go into like vinyl repertoire ever, or do you have unaccompanied? Is there unaccompanied stuff for Demore, or is it primarily yeah. with? There it? is unaccompanied stuff for Demore. Um, I can get I can get you a list that I just need to send you. Um, sure, sure, that's yeah. Great. But Ariosti wrote a lot of stuff oh, yeah. too. Yeah, and um, there's so many composers, and some of it actually is on IMSLP, which is interesting enough. Apparently, it's not interesting to anyone else. <laughs> So it's just sitting there. Um, yeah, um, but uh, there's lot, there are lots of solo works for Zamar. Um, there's some sonatas too and early, early pieces. I just can't, names are not are escaping me at the moment. Um, oh, they're all funny. insanely difficult. Not all, many are insanely yeah. difficult, but very rewarding. Because the viola, you can, the viola Zamar, um, because it's tuned, well, in thirds, fourths, and fifths, <laughs> fitting on, because it's a, it's, a it's a chord usually. It can also just be in intervals. Um, sometimes runs like the thirds runs that you do that you hear are actually just fifth stops across. Oh, oh wow! Yeah. yeah, or trills and thirds, for instance, are just sixths, if you will. You think of one. Oh. Uh, oh, sorry. Hold on. Wait, I can't think of one. I can't think of one right now. <laughs> Wait. There you go. Yeah, that. Okay. I only did it. I did a one stop across. I couldn't think of what to do. One, two, then a low. Yeah. Six. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you can keep going up the scale. It's really, really quite funny because you, you look at what you're playing in the scordatura and then you, you work out like, how am I doing that? How am I? <laughs> yeah. It's really quite interesting. Yeah, that, would take, that must take a lot of brain power. I, honestly. Yes, that's why I couldn't get it in my head. Yeah, Rachel Barton Pine is a big, big proponent of. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. You know she did the same thing. She found one, but hers was a Galliano that she got on auction, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so she bought it and learned how to play it. Yeah, as one does. Right? Yeah, as one does. Yeah. <laughs> she went to Terizio um, and said, "I'm going to play the viola." <laughs> right. Yeah. Other, um, I was just going to say, my only experience with the viola de more, I was, um, as I'm in an opera orchestra, I was lucky enough to be able to play yeah. the Puccini. Matt, um, Matt a butterfly. Several, several times. Um, and nice. I, was, I just made it up as I went along. I played with my, <laughs> my, my modern violin bow. And of course, it was tuned to, to 440. And yeah. um, anyway, so uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful whole new world that I might have to, yeah. as I'm sitting here in this, in my little snowy climate here, I might have to find another thing to, work on my brain with yeah it's totally worth it i can and i can send you some lots of stuff to get started with because it's just Very it's cool. really fun it's just it's just a matter of sitting down like i guess when you learn how to knit you know and you understand the concept which i don't knit but i mean it, i can see it being the same you have to just get into it yeah and learn how to do it and then you do it and yeah. use your brain yeah it's sort of a weaving in a way of sound yes that, that we're not used to are there pieces that maybe lurk in the 
Damore uh, repertoire that might work on viola or that you find work on just viola that you recommend for? Yes, actually, all, again, I said before, all of the Christoph Grappner pieces, oh, right, um, right, and they're right, actually right. even also written in alto clef, so it's just no brain brainer to even just look at it. Um, okay. Modern editions of the, of his music was misunderstood as viola repertoire anyway. Oh, so okay. um, yeah, so uh, uh, who, who's he? Amadeus, the the, the publisher, they published oh. a lot of a, a lot of Grappner's music as the viola concerto. It's not; it's the viola d'amore concerto, oh. but it's totally playable on the viola. So it's one of those things where it'd be fun because you can already hear the pitches. And you you could you could learn both you know and figure it out because um um yeah it doesn't go higher than what's comfortable on the viola it sometimes goes lower <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't go higher yeah right uh, that's nice to know you could always yeah. transpose it up if it's going too low yeah well and also the this well the solos in in the John's Passion Saint, uh, Passion Saint John by Bach um, violinist he he wrote it a later edition where it was it was two muted violins. Yeah instead of two viol violas d'amour playing the uh, the solos. I mean, it's a whole aria that's gorgeous, that it, it's 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 a, one of those uh, ostinato, wonderful, wonderful <laughs> movements that um, two of them that are just gorgeous. And I think it loses something with the two uh, violins, but I think it must've been a, a you know challenge at one point to find people to do it on the violas d'amour. But um, Jane Rogers insisted that everyone should be able to play this. There's also, you know, Hindemith wrote some works uh, for Viola de Mar. Uh, he wrote a concerto, which people don't know, his Klein, Sonata, uh, Klein, Klein, Klein Concert Number 6, I think it is, or Number 5. And then also his, his, um, you know, his camera concert, sorry, and his Klein Sonata for Viola de Mar and piano. And it's written for modern a modern instrument in 440. Um, because he played the viola de more. He was the, the 20th century biggest proponent of the instrument. I think he found it somewhere and decided to just look into it. And he played all the repertoire that he could find and he wrote some. Um, Ganacek, uh, it, one of his operas is viola de more. Yeah. Um, there's some string quartet. Ganacek's uh, uh, intimate letters, string quartet, you can replace. He, he, he originally wrote the viola part for viola de more, but he changed it back because you couldn't hear it. That was the only problem. It didn't work balance wise, but now it would because you can make a viola. My viola de mar is very loud, and before you couldn't do that. So there's lots of different repertoire that 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 go both ways, and that uh, modern composers wrote for the instrument. Stamitz wrote a lot of sonatas and and pieces for viola de mar, and his brother Carl and his brother. Right. So they, there's and Hofmeister wrote a string quartet, the viola de mar being the viola part. So there's lot there's lots of things in there. Yeah, and mind you, that means they also have a viola part for it too. For if you didn't have a tomorrow, yeah. That sounds like a whole bunch of uh, great ideas for listening and yeah. uh, and uh, and players. You mentioned Rachel Barton Pine and yes. Helen. And Helen, Pla yeah. Helen, Pla yeah, that's right. Um, and do you have yeah. another name or two to? Yeah, Garth um, Knox. Uh, he, Garth Knox, K N O X. Uh, he's a modern player. Um, he was in Arditi Quartet, and then in some, I can't ever pronounce anything in French. Uh, Ensemble Intercontemporain <laughs> in, in Paris. <laughs> Who less his ensemble? Anyway, uh, he's a soloist now, and he he he's a big big proponent of it. Um, Ra uh, Rachel Podger, who's a good oh, friend sure. here. Yeah. yeah, she plays Viola as well, and has a few discs, I believe. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there are loads, and like, people, lots of people dabble, which is what it's one of those things you can do. You can dabble in it. I mean, you have to put it. It take it's a uphill. It's a what do you call it? It's an uphill battle for a minute, and then the, then there's a plateau. You get it's, it's a steep learning curve. Yeah. yeah, for a bit because you have to wrap your head around it, and then once you learn one way, it goes. Oh, and then you can do this. <laughs> so then it's all these things. But um, yeah, yeah finding the repertoire and it, it's just amazing. Um, you can readily find repertoire online now these days. Uh, there are publishers that, that do have this repertoire available. Um, but it's a matter of, uh, for instance, uh, I have my, the Bach, when I first learned it the, for the St. John Passion, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what key to tune it in. You know, I had no idea what to do. So um, Leon King, he's a, he's a viola player and also a, a, a Baroque specialist as well. He ha He's wonderful, his resource, and violademore.com as well with, um, he's from Tuffle Music, Give me a second. Um, I hate when I, I I'm best so bad at names. Hold on, let me look it up. George, I won't look it up now. Jordan, actually, uh, no, Jordan. No, George. Um, give me a second. 
whatever. Uh, he's a violinist in Tafel Music. He has some recordings and uh, he plays viola de more as well. He also explains the instrument. Leon King, going back to him, he explains like very detailed how the instrument works. And when you want to play this piece, he gives you two options. It's in C minor and in D minor and whichever one works best for you. And then he gives you the scordatura and gives you instructions on how to play it. And, and like little bits when you run into something, it's because of this and you have to shift here and you don't shift here. And it's just a sheet, which is so oh. nice because you get you can just learn it. And it's one of those pieces where you can listen to it and then you can try and play it. You can even tune, if you have a violin at home, you can tune the top four strings uh, like a demore, mm -hmm. just to get started and, and just only yeah, the top four like. to get so what it feels like. Your hand yeah. and can learn new um, relationships. Exactly. And mm -hmm. it works in the viola as well, but you have to, it, you, you have to do the fifth lower just because you, if you, if you tighten the strings too much, they'll break. <laughs> they'll probably break. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, the top, yeah. The top, the top of the demore is much closer to the violin and the bottom, of course, is close, is close to the viola. And no one knows it, it's, it's an old instrument. It, it was an archaic instrument. Um, they're not sure how much it was used at the time, but it, it definitely came out of favor. When Bach used it, it was completely out of favor. He wanted it to sound ancient. That's why he chose yeah, the instrument. Exactly. Right. Uh, yeah, so it's one of those things where, and then it came back in, in the classical, in the early classical, and then well, all these pieces must have been for some Duke that played it or something, <laughs> you know, or whatever, it, or someone in the orchestra played it. And then, so you get Haydn writings and stuff and all these people. Um, yeah, so it's one of those things where you don't really know. Yeah, someone found it in an attic at Esterhazy and they dusted it off and like, <laughs> exactly. hey. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, lots of instruments fell on the, to the wayside that way. Like the um, Lerone, which many people don't know the instrument. It's a 15 string viol that I only saw when I was, do, I was doing uh, Orfeo on period instruments. I'm like, what's that? <laughs> you know, you're sitting at a pick, like, I have no idea what that is. You know, and the guy's like, like, yeah. Wrap it all the way around or something with the strings? <laughs> no, it's like, it's so flat. The, the, the bridge is flat. So it's a chordal instrument like the demore. So you don't use the bottom ones unless you're going to reach for a chord. So you, you're really only playing the top few, or whatever. But it has this droning type sound, and he used these drones actually. Um, that's another instrument that like who used it. Even when Orfeo was being was there, it really wasn't because okay. at the time opera the, the works thing could be many instruments. It didn't matter, matter which instrument you really picked up. Like there was no viola in it, but I, I played viola. I put I played it um, the tenor in the uh, what did I play? I played one of the, one of the viola parts, viola lines. I just wanted to fill the ensemble up. So I don't play viol, which I really, really regret. I know that that's such a such a beautiful instrument. It's very appealing to me too. Yeah, and now I have a bow. I should really. <laughs> there's, always, there's always time tomorrow, Clifton. Yes, this is yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. This is true. So I'm I'm really interested to hear the different instruments back to back. Yeah. Sure. And and talk about a little bit about how your technique has to change. Okay. To do the, yeah. like the same thing on each one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't play the same thing on the demore, but we'll, uh, let's do let's do the let's do the Brock viola and the modern viola. Funny enough, my Brock viola was made in 1930. My modern viola was made in 1704. <laughs> 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 there we go. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start with the Brock viola because um. Uh, wait, should I? No, I'm going to start in the modern viola because you know what that sounds like. Now, there'll be different pitch differences because one's tuned at 440 and the other one's tuned at 415. I think I'll do a bit of Telemann. Just pull this out. I know this concerto, but you know when you're playing with the other viola players, you have to make sure the notes are in front of you. <laughs> Um, uh, so one of my videos I did for, for One Camera, One Take was hilarious. I did the, uh, the Telemann Viola Concerto, but I, put, I, I just used a bunch of violas. And I, and I even added my Demore in there because I had it <laughs> it's just sitting there. So I played the main, the main solo part, and then um, I played a viola quartet version, and I added two more bits to it. That was so much fun because it, 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 it inspired me to look more deeply into the concerto. Mind you, it's one of my favorite, most favorite pieces. Um, it's overlooked and underplayed and overplayed at the same time, you know, <laughs> uh, but this, I, I this can tell you, Clifton, that, that in the Northern California Viola Society, we have done our best to overplay it. It's good. Yeah, we it's have, a, have a, um, an event every couple of years where we try to beat the Portuguese um, in the number of violists playing the Telemann Concerto in Amazing. the same room at the same time. 
That's amazing. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I was gonna play the very beginning of the of the Allegro. Just check. Just check tuning so I don't have to make time between. You hear the difference? Yeah. That's oh, right. <laughs> Sounds like a jam session is about to start. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give a demonstration of the modern viola with this. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny enough that has more. There's more tension in there, which means it's bouncier, sprightlier to me, and but also not necessarily historical. So I don't try to play the Telemann Concerto as historically as I would like to on my modern viola. I prefer, I prefer to leave that to the Brock viola. I'll play that now. Now, uh, play first. Yeah, so the two, wow. Yeah, it's completely different, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't try to fight the Baroque viola. It's what I, what I, I learned over the years. I tried before when I first was playing both to make the Baroque viola sound like the modern viola but they're not, they're completely different. There's lower tension. These are all gut strings. The top two, let's see, the top two are, are, are um, unwound guts. So they're just plain gut. And the, the G and the D, the G and the C are um, wound gut. So they, they respond differently. The bow is, is a different tension. This bow, I'm using my Demori bow just cause I'm liking it right now. It, the, over the last few weeks, I'm liking it on my Baroque viola at the moment. And I switch back and forth to different bows. But that, it also has a, softness to it and don't try and fight it also there's a difference in the response time from changing bows yeah um on a modern instrument it's more immediate it's gonna be a, a semitone higher <laughs> I, have all, I have all these different articulations i can do in the same stroke as we know. And Baroque, though, uh, Baroque viola was really meant for specific, specific strokes. I mean, it, it, it's made for it. So if you're doing like the Gloria, yeah, it is still short, but it's considerably longer than mm -hmm. if I was doing Vivaldi Gloria on the, we always hear like Academy St. Martin in the Fields, whatever <laughs> yeah it's that because that's just what this concave or con concave bow wants to do and so i mean i just don't fight it and especially in long tones the one thing you can't do is a long mezzo de voce on a, on a modern viol you can do it which again mezzo de voce is a long long note with hairpins so i'll, I'll do it on here mm. I can do it, but I'm making it happen. On the Baroque viola, it really melts into itself. I lost my contact point, try that again. Also, there's a thing we do called bow vibrato, which I, mean, I think you call it different things in different countries, but it's essentially um, pulsed. Uh, think of American terms. Uh, <laughs> I say quavers now. Uh, eighth notes. I'm actually using my middle two fingers more than my first finger to do this. Often on a on a modern bow, you have to use 
all of your joints. I'm still sticking the same instrument to make it happen. I'm using my thumb, my first finger, my second, everything to make that so it's smooth. But the Baroque bow does it all by itself. I mean, I'm hardly moving this. All I'm doing is slight tension release, slight tension release. And that's one thing you really notice um, when you put, like in the same week for me, if I played the same repertoire in a modern ensemble than in a Baroque ensemble. And uh, Dory can probably attest to that. Like you go, whoops, okay, that's, <laughs> it's just, it's incredibly, it's much easier and different in a Baroque ensemble. There's a misconception too that Baroque music is lighter and sometimes uh, more wishy-washy. And it's the opposite of that. It's exciting. And for me, more so exciting when played on proper period instruments um, with period performers. It, it actually, there's much more nuance and things that you can discuss. And also there's such a performance practice now that lots of things aren't, don't have to be discussed. They're, it's just felt. Bowings are not, are not dictated normally, like meaning there's a down bow, up bow differentiation, which we do know that down bows are often stronger than up bow. But in Baroque music, the down bow is, is um, is also in, in, in like an inflection. Yeah. And um, so when you're deciding with bow, you wouldn't go, you just wouldn't do that. And everyone knows that. So you don't have to write any of that in or even think about it. In the rehearsal, it's just, you know, and also thinking of phrasing, the phrasing is understood which I find really fascinating. Also, mind you, in modern playing as well, don't get me wrong, it's all over everything, but in specifically Baroque playing and early music playing, there's this understanding that everyone's on the same page immediately, as opposed to trying to decide how baroque we want to be. Do you hear that? We get that? Should we do this more baroque or sins of vibrato? Well, actually, there's, there's about a hundred different variables, variations of vibrato with, before you get to senza, mm -hmm. you know? And also, even when I was playing before the Demar, you, this vibrato is more of an ornament as opposed to just a thing you have to do. That sounds funny, <laughs> but. I mean, it just makes sense that there's some little bit of vib in there, a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. So all these things come into play when, you, when you're switching these instruments and the sound that you create. It is a fuzzier sound, which is interesting. You, I don't know if you can hear it through the microphone. It's decidedly yeah. rounder, fuzzy. Yeah. And that's the word I use when I, especially when explaining it the best way I can. The Demore doesn't have that fuzzy. On modern Demore and, and, and Baroque, it's not that because the strings are so tense. Mm -hmm. You don't get that. But on viola, it's fuzzy and it's a good fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And it's the middle voice it, it's we all, as we all are, you know. It's just so wonderful. So I rambled a bit about the tuning and the bowing. <laughs> on the on the demore, just to ju jump back for a yeah. second, I have a thought or a question about. So, what? Um, where do you get your strings, and do you have to um, replace the sympathetic strings? Yeah, uh, easy, easy oh, to. Yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah, the strings, these ones are, uh, another name I can't pronounce. It's actually American. You know, De, uh, uh, Damien Duglielki. Duglielki. Duglielki, yeah, Duglielki. <laughs> yeah, that's what this set is at present, and I bought a bunch of them. He makes a full Demore set, which oh. is quite nice. But you don't have to, the top four strings are un, unwound if, you, if it's gut. Um, okay. And my, this, my string popped the other day, the, my D, so I'm using a violin E because it's exact. This 0.58. It's the same same. You use okay. um, gauges. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Times it's, it's, uh, yeah, you use different gauges, so th they're all gauged. But you have to know what your what your normal tuning is. So mine, since I use so many different tunings, I have to have a gauge that's an average of everything. Right. But, um, yeah, but they do make a standard viola tenore set, and like Shar in the U.S. I think have. Um, I can't remember now. Here at String Zone. And and um, also the, in Poland that there's there's string king, which are actually worth noting for for historical stuff because they send it over to the U.S. Um, he's, he's called Gabriel. He's amazing. He's in, he's in it's Sweden and in Poland. This guy, um, but they sell all the different strings. La Folia, uh, are a major brand of string makers, they do Demore set. But you again, the top ones you you can use you can use um, all the violin gauges, and the next two you can use viola gauges for the C and the G if you want. Okay. Um, but they, they they do make specific viola tamari strings. I did a gamut as well. That's in America. Uh, yeah. Last time I was there, I bought everything they had because it was sixty percent off. 
I got right. a C-string for seventeen dollars. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> they have some good sales. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. some some of the ones I bought though are for you are for um, uh, loot. Right. So you um, you sort of tried different gauges and just see what works. Yes. For, and then for different tunings, that's a whole other. Yes. But then I, yeah, what I know, learned over the years too is to ask a, a maker, like a person who knows, yeah, yeah. because they're, they're these experts. They all know what gauges work the best. And there's these gauge calculators you can do too, like saying what string, what, what notes you want. And you, they tell you the string length, this to here. You tell right. you put that into the calculator. Gamut on their website has this and it tells you what string you should buy. If you say what note you want in what, like at A415, but you want the F sharp string, which is a weird string, yes. Yeah. You want the F sharp <laughs> string in A415 at this string length, it'll tell you which gauge to buy. It doesn't tell you it's an F, it tells you it's it's a 1.18 or whatever the. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. that's why. That's why. String so you wrote up on strings before Brexit hits? Yeah, yeah. It, well, I still have things supposedly coming to the UK, which I'm really worried about that haven't come from from String King that didn't arrive. I'm probably going to make customs now on it, even though I bought it before. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, it, <laughs> yeah. How All of our that, work. Yeah. yeah. How is that affecting you? So, or you don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, I do because it happened two years ago. Because remember, like quartets and festivals, they they book in way in advance. Um, mm -hmm. We we usually do lots of festivals, even the ones in Switzerland and in in Norway. We just we, we weren't asked like from 2018. We just uh, weren't okay. asked for for 2020 and 2021. So I mean, we have good to, we, we've learned that now we're going to expand further and go into Asia and to to um, Australia and more in the U.S. because we had a larger presence in the U.S. before, and now we're going to jump back into that because it's the same. You know, you can easily go to the U.S. now and supposed to try, even just going to France. Yeah, <laughs> paperwork and our, our instruments have to have passports and all these things. Yes. Yeah. And if and you probably saw that a few of my bows. I mean, yeah, this 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 was 1785, but it's ivory. Mm -hmm. This was 1968, but it's ivory, so I can't take it out of the country yet. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the different woods, some of the yes. some of the different hardwoods on our frogs. Yes. Or sticks yes. Or Luckily, I have I have equipment to use. When I I've always known this, like the bow, my modern bow that I use mainly, because it, it, it's a it's a hill. The not the hill. It's a it's a oshard. The uh, tip is metal anyway. It's silver. So there's no. It's only ebony. But this used to be uh, whalebone, but I had it made fake. No, <laughs> just so I could take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, friend, yeah it's just. A, a, sorry. I remember, a friend was um, literally getting to the airport when she realized that she had the wrong bow. She had like somebody come, come yeah. and bring her the right a uh, uh, a bow that she could yeah. wear. Yeah, it's happened here. Um, yeah, going to Russia, it was that, and someone had to have their father come to the airport like their elderly father, because <laughs> I soon knew which boat, you know, to go into <laughs> yeah. the house. Yeah, they go, yeah, go get it. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it's tough. We don't know the, the real repercussions yet, but um, everything on my Demore, which is interesting, the maker, again, Jonathan Hill, he's fantastic. He made everything, the bridge, he, this is my second tailpiece he's done. He did a really ornate one that didn't work for me just because it was pretty, but it was actually narrow and I wanted a really fat one so all the strings were as far apart as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but he made another one. All of these bits that are white are actual cow bone that he went to, he goes to a, um, to a butcher and asks for the bones and he preps them all. The little pits in my pegs, which are boxwood, and then there's white bits, all of it. And on the back, all you can see better pictures on my website of the instrument. All of it's like uh, cow bone, which is, I mean, you can find that in the rubbish bin, <laughs> the trash can, right. you know, anywhere. Yeah. yeah. So he he purposely uses materials that can be used that can be reused. The woods, the spruce on the this maple on the back, and spruce on the top. But then this is like apple wood, so it's sustainable, and okay. it's really interesting. And I mean, this, it, the scrolled it, it's all carved. You can see, oh, but yeah. he's used very, very, very sustainable uh, items. I just don't, I never met a, a maker that knows how to make such ornate pegs, and he's he carved the scroll. Beautiful. Worth noting, usually in in period instruments. The scroll isn't carved by the maker because there's a specialist that does that. Like meaning the the angel. Like if it's a regular scroll, yes. But right. these these carved things, usually you get you outsource it. You send the the block to someone and they do the thing and they send it back to you. And then you also you pay for someone to make the pegs and he did everything. He also had a what's it called? A clavichord maker uh, make my my sympathetic strings. 
He didn't like all the strings that he could find for the sympathetics. So he decided to make double set for me, to get this guy and commission him to, oh. to make, they're all clavichord strings, which is really, really weird. So they have a different resonance. Yeah. A very long resonance. Mind you, normal sympathetic strings work nicely. He just was getting, he, he loved our project together because yeah. I told him go, go, go nuts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's oh, wonderful. Interesting. So would yeah. they would normally be um, wire or they wire for the body? Yeah, okay. Carastro makes a whole set. They're really like it's thirty dollars for the for the set of them. The, uh, the upper ones are more expensive, but the lower ones are really. And how do they attach? Are they uh, in the bridge in the peg box? Yeah. Okay. How to explain this? Okay, they go under the tailpiece. You see that 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 nut there? So there's three. In pen, in pen, in oh, yeah, yeah. You see, end buttons, end buttons. It's one big one and two little ones. Sometimes there's seven like studs that people put in, and then there's a string wrapped around each one. But this is better, so I can do it myself. I don't have to take it in to change. And this just goes under the bridge. Do you see that white? Like, it's hard to see. It goes under the bridge. It's sitting on another piece of bone. So all the strings go under the bridge, and then under the uh, the tail, the the fingerboard. Yeah. And so then they come up. They go inside the neck then. Yes. But just, just yeah, they go all the way inside the neck. And you see, they go inside the neck and they come out here. You, see, you can probably see the angle. Yeah. I put my hand against it. Yeah. Oh, yes. And they, do you ever um, strum them? Yeah. Um, I have to, not to play, but to tune. For instance, I'll just tune the D. I have to do this. And what I do is it's the reverse. These go up this way and these start here. All of these top ones are the sympathetics and all of these are the, yeah. Okay. So I go. Oh, I see it's backwards. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And you tune it like, yeah, the, yeah backward. I can't, it's, it's ah, backwards. Ah, opposite. Ah. Yeah. And, but the problem is, is trying to strum them all. Yeah. I'm do one more. Try again. Wait. That's how that's a tune. So you kind of do that one by one and you hope for the best. But you see in concert, I don't know how many times it's just not been in tune, but it doesn't matter because the top ones are, they just they sound considerably better though when they're all because they ring, <laughs> they really, really ring. Yeah. They, don't, they don't sound out of tune, it just they ring more when that when it's the same D. Sure. You just see it's the same D. Yeah. So when I play the D, yeah. see, it's a little sharp now, but Yeah. longer yeah 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 you see yeah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i learned a long time ago not to fuss with it because um you will go insane <laughs> trying to make sure they stay it too. unless you're recording then you just have to keep doing it but otherwise yeah. just yeah play, just play. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I learned that. I asked Jane Rogers, actually, how do you keep it in tune? She goes, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I just learn to work with whatever is coming out of the, you know, instrument. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, I am sure we could go on and on and on, but this, I suppose we should wrap it up because right. our... Okay. <laughs> um... I ended it there because I think we're we're really close to way over time. And um, uh, anyway, if, if people have re any old responses they'd like to make or any questions, um, otherwise we'll we'll turn you loose. <laughs>